Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining for our first Midday Science Cafe of the new year. We are so excited to have you for Paving the Way, California's Road to Vehicle Electrification, um, featuring Priyanka Mohanty from Berkeley Lab and Ted Lamb from UC Berkeley. Thank you for bearing with us as we had silence as we let you guys in. Normally, we play music during our intro, but we couldn't get our audio working. So we will have music, intro music back again um, in March. I promise you, we will figure it out. As we normally do with our Midday Science Cafes um, and all of our programming, we are going to start today with a uh, land acknowledgement. We recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land in which we stand, but we also recognize that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities to today. And I wanna thank you again for allowing the time and the moment so that we can give that land acknowledgement. Um, my name is Dion Rossiter. I don't think I've said that yet. I'm the executive director of Science at Cal, one of the co-hosts of this program. In 2008, Science at Cal was envisioned as a unifying effort to raise public awareness, understanding, and appreciation of scientific research at Berkeley. To realize this vision, we engage the vast Berkeley science, technology, engineering, and mathematics communities to foster creative collaborations among campus and community-based groups who share our commitment to equity and inclusion in STEM education and STEM careers. Science at Cal connects researchers with diverse community groups of all ages and backgrounds for science engagement and learning, accessibility, inclusiveness, and creativity and innovation are just a few of the hallmarks of Science at Cal events, which reach, reach tens of thousands of people annually, as you saw in my last slide. They're all free, they're all geared towards public audiences. We take pride in making sure that we are engaging with all communities. Throughout the year, we present ongoing outreach programs. We're both on and off campus. We help promote related efforts and we create new programs and new initiatives at Berkeley and in the community. This broad scope of activities is made possible by Science at Cal's dynamic network of campus alliances and valuable community partners. Before I hand things over to Berkeley Lab to say hello and introduce our first speaker, I just want you to remind you that these events are always very interactive. We expect a ton of Q&A, so please add your questions either in the Q&A chat box, uh, box or in the chat. You don't need to put them in both. You can put them in just one and we will get to as many questions as we can. We have an amazing turnout today, don't we, Jen? I'm going to hand things over to Jen Tang from Berkeley Lab. And it is just so nice to see so many of you here um, for our first event back. Exactly. Thanks, Dee. Uh, so hi, folks. I'm Jen Tang, and I'm the Director of Community Relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And for those who aren't familiar, Berkeley Lab is one of 17 U.S. Department of Energy national research laboratories across the country. Berkeley Lab is supported by DOE's Office of Science, and we're managed by the University of California, and all of the research we conduct is unclassified. Since our founding in 1931 by a UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, we've been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking answers to some of the most challenging issues facing humankind. Now today, Berkeley Lab employees work together to develop meaningful scientific solutions to the world's most intractable energy and environmental challenges. We help train the next generation of scientists and engineers, and we ensure that those things happen in a manner that benefits everyone. Our main campus is located in the Berkeley Hills, and our close ties to the UC system create a really unique and synergistic environment for scientific discovery. Now, many of our lab's researchers are affiliated with one of the UC campuses, either as students, postdocs, or professors who might have joint appointments with the lab. 
And we're fortunate to have an especially close relationship with UC Berkeley and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across many different frontiers. One of the main motivations for our Midday Science Cafe series is to share with you examples of these compelling and complementary scientific research projects from both of our institutions. And we hope you enjoy today's presentation on electrification of the transportation sector. So to get us started, it is my pleasure to invite our first speaker to the screen, Dr. Priyanka Mohanty. Now, Priyanka works jointly at Berkeley Lab as a senior research analyst in the Energy Analysis and Environmental Impacts Division, as well as a, she's a research analyst at the Goldman School of Public Policy. And in both of these positions, Priyanka analyzes policy and regulatory issues related to different countries' energy transitions across the power, transport, and industrial sectors. And she's focused on work surrounding the just transition as it relates to the aforementioned sectors. Priyanka earned her master's degree uh, with UC Berkeley's Energy and Resources Group, where she worked on a variety of issues through work at Berkeley Lab, the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research, and the Socio-Spatial Climate Collaborative. And that included analysis of the economic benefits of just transition policies, the techno-economics of energy transitions, transport decarbonization, and governance models for climate adaptation and mitigation. And prior to her time with the Energy Resources Group, she worked with the New Climate Economy, which is a major international initiative housed within the World Resource Institute and is governed by the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate. And in Priyanka's spare time, she is training to be a type two firefighter, which is just amazing. I love that. Uh, she's learning many things, including how to administer prescribed burns for vegetation management. So with that, Priyanka, I'm going to hand things over to you. Thank you so much, Jen. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, so I am here to talk about a recent report that we released through Lawrence Berkeley Lab in conjunction with the Goldman School of Public Policy, Grid Lab and Energy Innovation, and it's titled 2035 2.0, How Plummeting Costs and Dramatic Improvements in Batteries Can Accelerate Our Clean Transportation Future. So some context setting here. Um, first of all, really exciting news that the battery industry has beaten battery price projections. So if you see here on this graph, you'll see battery pack prices on the y-axis and years on the x-axis. And a lot of the estimates that were made in 2010 or previously um, estimated that battery prices and their drop their drop in prices would not be that dramatic. But instead, what we're seeing is that battery prices are falling dramatically. Um, and we project that these prices will drop as low as around $50 a kilowatt hour by 2030. So why is this important? Well, um, we know that we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in order to tackle climate change. And in order to do that in our power and our transport sectors, we will need cheap, long duration batteries, both to replace our gasoline powered engines in our cars and also to install battery energy storage systems. I'll be focusing on the former around gasoline powered engines and electrification of transport. So the question that we asked ourselves with this report was, given these recent declines in battery costs, what are the impacts of rapidly electrifying our ground transport on consumers, electric infrastructure, employment, emissions, and public health. So we modeled two scenarios. Um, the first was looking at uh, passenger cars and um, what I will call light duty vehicles, um, having 100% sales of those light duty vehicles be electric by 2030. The second part of this was electrifying the sales to 100% of our medium and heavy duty vehicles by 2035. And so this is sort of what we, when we think of freight trucks, or those really large vehicles that we see on the road, um, that's what we're talking about. So the first thing that I wanna highlight here is that our results showed us that when we electrify our transport, everyone benefits. So consumers save about $2.7 trillion between 2020 and 2050. And this averages out to around 100 to 200 billion per year over the next 30 years. In terms of household savings, that can be around $1,000 a year. And the reason this is, is because we found, and many other studies find, that actually owning an electric vehicle is going to be cheaper than owning a gas-powered vehicle. 
Um, while the upfront costs are still a bit higher, the total cost of ownership is much lower because you're not paying those expensive fuel prices that we're all experiencing, and the maintenance and operations of an electric vehicle is much cheaper than that of its gas-powered counterpart. In fact, when we included environmental benefits in this cost analysis, we found that total savings are actually in excess of $4 trillion. Um, but if we delay our targets, we also lose a lot of those consumer savings, roughly $400 billion um, deferred. So, I've, you know, we have these consumer savings, we know the economic case, but I think it's really important for us to also talk about what are the health and environmental impacts of our current transportation system? Why is it important to electrify our transport? Well, gasoline and diesel powered vehicles harm our human health. Unfortunately, that's a scientific fact. And they do this through a couple of different ways. Um, the first is through pollutants, what we call fine particulate matter. And this fine particulate matter can cause a variety of issues in our bodies from our cardiovascular systems to our respiratory systems, cancer, premature death, asthma, um, as well as the fact that our cars also emit things like nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, and of course, greenhouse gas emissions, which are the main contributing cause to climate change. But it's also important to note that these impacts and these health impacts in particular are not felt evenly. So in America, um, a history of redlining and racialized development has made it so people and communities who are living along highways in our country, um, predominantly African-American, Latino, and low-income households here in California and nationally, expo are exposed to much more particulate matter or what we'll call pollution compared to white affluent households. In fact, according to the US EPA, around 72 million Americans live in close proximity to heavy trucking corridors. And these people are more likely to be people of color and those who have lower incomes. Um, as I mentioned, this air pollution can cause a lot of really damaging impacts to our bodies, including poor birth outcomes, as well as the all, all of the other issues that I mentioned previously. So I want to just point out this map on this screen. So you'll see here what our trucking and freight corridors look like in America. Um, the red lines show uh, where the high, where uh, more than 8,500 trucks uh, pass through these highways every day. Um, and as I mentioned, the people who live along those highways uh, belong to a certain group, but also there aren't that many trucks in our country. There are 5% of on-road vehicles, and yet they contribute around 36% of particulate emissions. And this is a really disproportionate share, given that most of the transport on the road are cars. So why is this important? Well, our scenario electrifies transport, both in terms of our trucks and our cars. And we found that ground transportation emissions fall by 93% in 2050. Um, and this is really corresponded with some of those premature deaths and health problems I was talking about. We see a drastic reduction in pollution-related premature deaths as a result of um, reducing our emissions from our transport sector. Uh, so another question that we got on this report that I think is important to highlight is what's going to happen to our electrical grid when we um, add all of this electrification from our transport sector? So a couple of pieces here that I want to highlight. The first is that a 90% clean grid we found can handle the additional demand due to electrification. So what does a clean grid mean? That means wind, solar, and some of that battery storage capacity that needs to be installed every year. Uh, we found that um, that investment also needs to be coupled with an investment in our charging infrastructure, public charging, as well as um, highway charging in order to meet charging demands for some of those freight trucks. But ultimately, we found that with those investments being made, um, it's possible to meet the electrification demand that we're going to experience with um, transport electrification. And that demand growth is commensurate with historical growth. So we also, the final big key piece of our report that um, was really exciting was the fact that accelerating EV sales and decarbonizing, decarbonizing our grid in tandem can lead to a net employment gain of 2 million jobs by 2035 driven both by EV manufacturing in this country 
infrastructure build out. So those charging infrastructure that I mentioned and developing a grid that can handle that electrification, um, as well as induced jobs due to large consumer savings. People have more money in their pockets and they can do more with that and there's more economic freedom there. Um, of course, it's important to remember that there will be job losses in the transport sector. This transition means that there is going to be job change, maybe in auto repair and some auto manufacturing. So it's important to make sure that this transition is done in an equitable way and those workers are taken care of. And that's a huge part of um, the work that we, um, the work that uh, needs to be done in the transport sector. So what are the policies needed to drive this scenario? Um, I want to highlight a couple of these in the interest of time, but in particular, domestic manufacturing, strong national and state standards, targeted incentives, EV-friendly building codes, and environmental justice measures are going to be absolutely critical to ensure that we do actually reap 100% of our, our car sales as electric by 2035. So strong national and state vehicle standards will absolutely lead the way. The good news is we already have a, a, a strong basis for this. Um, at the federal level, we have greenhouse gas emission standards, we have fuel economy standards. And here in California, my colleague Ted is going to talk more about this, but we are actually sort of a leader in this space. Um, Governor Gavin Newsom with his commitment to reach 100% zero emission or electric vehicle sales by 2035 has been an impetus for the state to work to move towards electrified transport. Um, so here are a couple of other policy actions that we, we looked at, um, and the main point I want to highlight here is that you see the key at the bottom shows federal, state, local, and utility, and a lot of these policies have to be done in concert with each other in order to be effective, um, and there's a lot of really um, exciting opportunities for the federal, state, and local governments to partner with utilities and ensure that the transition is a smooth one. So uh, recently, you all may have heard that President Biden and the Biden administration passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the largest climate uh, piece of legislation passed in the United States of America. And a lot of that legislation was really focused on transport electrification. Um, some of those policies that I mentioned, domestic manufacturing, point of sale rebates and tax incentives for Americans to buy electric vehicles, grants and incentives to build out a public charging network, replacing diesel transit vehicles with electric vehicles, electrifying our school buses, um, and also federally procuring our EVs while focusing on those workforce and equity changes that I talked about. But I think it's really important to note that the IRA addresses some of the concerns to make the transition equitable, but there is still much more to be done in order to make sure that we all access this electric vehicle transition, this transformation. Um, so a couple of things that I wanted to highlight. The first is making sure there are economic incentives for frontline communities and communities who have been the most affected by our current system to actually access these benefits. Um, you know, it, it it's as we see the situation right now, a lot of the people who have the upfront purchasing power to buy these vehicles are the ones that are doing so. Um, but creating incentives to lower that upfront price will be really important to make sure that we can all benefit. Second, of course, is subsidizing public charging infrastructure. Um, as somebody who's trying to decide whether to buy an electric vehicle right now, I'm a renter. I don't have access to my own private charging like most homeowners do. Um, making that decision will mean thinking about where can I access public charging? And third, of course, is prioritizing the electrification of those heavily trafficked highway and freight corridors. Thank you so much for your time and uh, I really look forward to your questions. Thanks so much, Priyanka. That was a really fascinating presentation. Uh, so we've got a couple questions for you to kick us off, and then we'll get to the rest that are coming in through the chat and the Q and A uh, during our during our broader session. So first, um, you know, not not everybody wants or can afford an electric car, as you've mentioned. So can you actually expand a little bit about electrification of other modes of transportation? Um, you know, for example, what about electrification of public transit or other rail systems? Absolutely, um, Jen, thank you so much for that question. 
as you said, our solution here to decarbonizing the transport sector cannot be simply a one-to-one -one replacement where we take your car and we give you an EV. We really need to be creating other modes of transportation in concert with thinking about things like housing and urban development. So as you mentioned, public transit is going to be a huge one. You know, we have our existing public transit systems and something I hear a lot is um, it's too expensive to build out a public transit system. But here's the thing, we have the roads built and things like electric buses can really change the game, creating bus lanes for these electric buses, more stops, more routes, and making it accessible, I think is going to be really important. You also mentioned um, our train infrastructure. And I think this is a really important opportunity to note that America has one of actually the largest rail networks in the world, but it's primarily used for freight. Um, we're seeing the downsides of that with the recent tragedy that's been happening in East Palestine, Ohio, um, where a lot of our freight has not been updated in a long time. Things are derailing, but this is also an opportunity for us to really examine how do we want to get around in this country? Do we have the building blocks in place for us to make our, transit, our, our train system not only work for freight, but also work for us? Um, and I highly encourage folks to look into that and think about that. I think train electrification is going to be so interesting, especially as um, a transit mode and also as an opportunity for energy storage. Um, and I'm happy to share some of our recent work that we did about that as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Priyanka. Um, you know, we've got so many questions that are coming in. I want to make sure we get to Ted's presentation and then we're just going to have a full Q&A with you both. So why don't I actually uh, turn things back over to Dee to introduce our next speaker. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, that really, really was fascinating. And obviously we have more to come from Ted. Ted Lamb is a senior research fellow in the climate program at the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment also known as CLE, within Berkeley Law. Ted's research focuses on California climate change law and policy and the relationships between other areas of policy and the achievement of California's climate change related goals. His recent work has centered on electric vehicles and transportation policy, climate change, insurance, and financial risk, and implementing local climate action. Prior to joining CLE, Ted practiced both environmental law and corporate law in New York City at New York University School of Law, where Ted received his JD. He was uh, the symposium editor of the Environmental Law Journal and participated in the NYU NRDC Environmental Law Clinic. Ted received his AB in English and Economics from Brown University. He has been admitted to the California, New York, DC Circuit, and Supreme Court bars. He also makes hot sauce in his spare time. So all of those accolades, I'm excited about that too. And we can't wait to hear from you, Ted. Take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Dee. And are my slides showing? They are. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Priyanka, for that fantastic uh, opening presentation. Uh, just as a note, I'm not going to present any science. So it's a little bit of a... a, a misclaim to the science uh, cafe today. I hope that's okay with everyone. And I'm also going to present on a, a research initiative that we here at the center are kicking off. So I don't have results to show you yet, but plans for the future. Um, so as, as Dee mentioned, I work at the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment. We are an environmental and climate policy think tank based at the law school. Um, we work on a range of California climate policy issues with an increasing focus on transportation and vehicle electrification. And what I'm going to talk about today is our electric vehicle equity initiative that we're just kicking off, and it touches on a lot of the issues that Priyanka was just describing. So going back to the EV transition that we're having here in the state, as Priyanka mentioned, um, Governor Newsom and California's Air Resources Board, our main uh, vehicle emissions and air quality regulator, have set in regulation um, a target to achieve 100% zero emission vehicle sales by 2035, i.e. to phase out the sale of internal combustion, uh, traditional gasoline powered engine vehicles by 2035. So those vehicles won't be taken off the road, but they will no longer be available for sale as new vehicles after that date. Um, it's an incredibly ambitious goal, but it's one that the state is actually making decent progress toward. Um, and last year, almost 19% of all new light duty uh, passenger vehicle sales in the state were electric vehicles. And that includes plug-in hybrids and standard electric vehicles. Um, 
It's a really, really high number. Uh, California is leading the nation in this. We have uh, approximately half of all EV sales in the country uh, are made in California. And uh, it's it's a really impressive, it really impressive just data point from uh, from 10 or so years ago when these vehicles were not on the road. And uh, I think it's something that many of us around the state, particularly here in the Bay Area, we can just see the evidence of. Uh, there are EVs everywhere and there are all kinds of models available. Now, Priyanka did a really good job of describing what the reasons are and the benefits uh, of the EV transition are. But I, I just wanted to share this sort of data point, which is now about a, a year out of date, I think, from the Union of Concerned Scientists, which shows just how impressive uh, EVs can be from a performance perspective. Now, the average nationwide average um, vehicle gets about 25 miles per gallon using a standard gasoline engine. The average electric vehicle gets the equivalent, uh, converting to energy sources, of about 90 miles per gallon. And here in California, uh, that's over 100 miles per gallon equivalent. And as you can see in different power zones around the state, there's a lot of difference here. And that is based entirely on how clean the grid in those uh, areas areas are. So a grid that is powered entirely with coal and fossil fuels uh, in some of the darker shaded areas are going to have uh, worse performance in terms of miles per gallon equivalent, whereas the cleaner grids, um, for example, New York uh, upstate, where they have a lot of hydropower, are achieving really incredible, uh, ultimately, what are efficiency uh, standards. And that means less greenhouse gas emissions, less carbon in the atmosphere, and reductions in all of the particulate matter and nitrogen oxides and other hearth, uh, health harmful uh, pollutants that Priyanka was describing earlier. So uh, it is definitely true that electric vehicles still do uh, cause some emissions, but as the grid gets cleaner over time, they will cause less and less and less, which is a huge advantage over internal combustion technology, which is always going to be uh, emitting from the point source of the car. So it's it's a really, it's, it's an impressive and increasingly impressive technology. Um, now, I mentioned that California reached 19% almost uh, EV sales last year. This is the result of a 10 plus year policy uh, effort. Uh, the state, state leaders, the governors in, in successive order, legislators and agencies have developed a series of targets like the 100% by 2035 that I mentioned earlier, uh, mandates, which is the uh, policy mechanism through which the Air Resources Board directs vehicle manufacturers to uh, sell those types of vehicles, incentives, which is how the state offers um, money and rebates and other types of programs to help consumers purchase vehicles or rent vehicles, and to help uh, businesses and other entities install infrastructure. And then the infrastructure itself with the state in some cases directly is funding. So some of these programs, just for example, you may have heard of them, uh, the Advanced Clean Cars Regulations, that is the program that the Air Resources Board recently updated to set this 2035 target. Uh, the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project, which actually offers just a cash rebate to Californians who uh, qualify and who purchase a new EV. And that goes alongside federal rebates, which are also available and, and very, very popular. Um, programs like the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, which actually treats electricity as a vehicle fuel and provides uh, credits in a tradable market for providers of that uh, fuel. So it creates an advantage for electricity over traditional fossil fuels and similar kinds of programs. And all these combined have helped lead to this 19% rate, which is by far the best in this country, although it uh, certainly outpaced by certain European countries. Um, what has been maybe not necessarily missing, but an open question over the course of the past decade with all these policies is how they fit with equity principles. And California, across all of its environmental and climate programs, has been increasingly looking to equity and environmental justice in terms of how we direct our investments and how we incentivize change in the environmental system. Um, a lot of these programs, uh, naturally and understandably, are dealing with new technologies that are quite expensive. And so a lot of the consumers and residents who have had access to the technology tend to be wealthier residents. Um, that is one way that the state can help support uh, technological development is by providing incentives to get it off the ground. As this becomes a mandate, and as we set a uh, decade plus timeline to phase out the existing technology, equity is going to be key. So in that question, one thing that we know is that public charging infrastructure and vehicle adoption go hand in hand. So this, uh, this chart here from the International Council on Clean Transportation is, is, is also, I think, about a year old, but it shows really, really helpfully um, a correlation, not necessarily causation, but a correlation between publicly available charging on the, on the x-axis and the share of electric vehicles in the population on the y-axis. And we can see a pretty direct correlation with cities like San Francisco, San Jose, and Los Angeles, major, major U.S. cities, um, really leading on both. And it's pretty clear 
that publicly available and accessible charging is just a prerequisite to high adoption. However, there's a substantial equity gap, as I was describing earlier, these vehicles have been accessible mostly to higher income individuals, and they're also accessible to those individuals, not just because of the cost, but because of the nature of the infrastructure itself. And what we see here from the California Energy Commission is that publicly available infrastructure is much more available in high income communities than in low income communities in California. And this, does, this addresses public infrastructure, it does not address, which is an even bigger gap, private infrastructure, which is chargers in private driveways and private garages. Now, as Priyanka was hinting at earlier, that infrastructure is necessarily going to be limited to those who actually own their own or have access to their own private driveway and private uh, garage. So it's very easy to imagine that, I don't have the numbers on it right now, but it's very easy to imagine that this disparity we see between high income and low income on the public side is going to be even greater if we take all charging into account. And if you want to define equity in a, in a, in a different way, it's not just about um, high income and low income, it's also uh, very much regionally defined within the state. And the Bay Area and, uh, and Southern California, greater Los Angeles areas have by far the most public chargers. They also have most of the population. But what you can see uh, from the second uh, chart from the California Energy Commission is that many of the rural counties in the state have very, very little access to public charging. Um, and so this creates a second layer of equity challenge across income, and across rural versus urban in the state. At the same time, um, this is data from a uh, Union of Concerned Scientists and um, EV Noir, which is an EV support group uh, study, uh, a survey study that they did last year, which shows that the communities that are actually most interested in uh, buying, leasing, or taking up an EV are actually Black, Latino, and Asian Americans. Um, and that's what this data shows here uh, on the right half of this chart, is that those are the populations that responded most favorably to EVs when surveyed. Um, however, these same groups, uh, Black, Latino, and Asian Americans, are more likely to live in a uh, multi-unit dwelling than white Americans, and they're more likely to rent their home than white Americans. So as we're thinking about access to the private infrastructure, access to the driveways and the garages, some of the Americans who are most interested in these vehicles have the least ability to actually install their own charger at home. So they're more reliant on public infrastructure, which we know is less likely to exist in their neighborhoods. So this creates a real equity gap and a real challenge for California policymakers to solve. State leaders have started with a, a suite of equity policies, and I'm not going to run through all of these here, but just a couple to highlight that I think are really valuable in this space but need to be accelerated. Um, the first is the uh, Cal Enviro Screen Program, which essentially identifies high pollution burden and lower income communities throughout the state and requires that a portion of state funds that are generated by the cap and trade program uh, for greenhouse gas emissions go to or benefit those communities. It's a really essential tool. It's one that we pioneered here in California and now the federal government has taken up its own equivalent and other states are matching it. Really, really valuable existing program needs to get ramped up. Um, another example is for the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project, which I mentioned earlier, as well as the Clean Cars for All program, uh, state leaders have income capped those programs so that they are only available to Californians with incomes below a certain level. Really, really valuable as EVs start to become the standard for certain communities and more affordable to make sure that they are not, uh, that the state is not delivering cash incentives to those who do not need them to make their next vehicle purchase an EV. And then finally, I'll just highlight one more. Uh, which is a, a bill that was passed last year, SB 1251, which created the new position of the ZEV equity advocate in the governor's office. Um, and this is someone who's going to be exclusively dedicated to some of the policies that I'm talking about right now and ensuring that they reach the, the target populations in the state. The, that position has not yet been filled, but once it is, there's going to be a point person in the governor's office for this issue, which is a really, really important step. So all of this is background to the initiative that we're about to kick off at our center, which is really focused on delivering this incredible vehicle transition to communities that need the most focus um, and ensuring that they're not left behind in the vehicle transition. And this is our EV equity initiative. I'm just going to give a brief overview of what we plan to work on over the next couple of years. Um, we're going to form city partnerships with multiple California cities uh, and work directly with their city staff and other stakeholders to try to form uh, viable uh, plans and, 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 uh, and, and action plans, really, to get um, infrastructure off the ground in underserved communities. Uh, we're going to conduct mapping exercises to identify where underserved communities have the right infrastructure, the right commercial zones, the right parks, um, and then match that with community input on where people actually want chargers to exist and where they think they might use them 
to identify what's highest priority first in a community for investment. Uh, we're going to conduct community engagement and outreach, like I just described, to make sure that uh, residents are on board with where chargers might go and where they might use them most. We're also going to coordinate across the local governments, utilities, uh, EV supply and charger providers, uh, and, and businesses to make sure that the sort of full ecosystem is on board with this transition and where the infrastructure is located. Uh, the goal is going to be to develop implementation guides, action plans, best practices, and uh, innovative funding and financing solutions so that cities can develop locally appropriate strategies and then get them off the ground quickly, especially with all the federal money that's coming online, which uh, Priyanka described a minute earlier. Uh, we hope to produce a statewide resource hub that will contain all this documentation so that the cities that we don't get to work with have access to information and to each other and can communicate about their different strategies. And if we find that new legislation is needed at the state level, um, if all the wonderful initiatives that I just mentioned are, are ineffective or need a boost, uh, we hope to help uh, uh, craft and, and, and move that legislation forward. Um, lastly, I just want to briefly describe a couple of principles that that we and I are working through in crafting this kind of project, um, what we think needs to inform um, equity in this space. Uh, the first is that when this transition, this, this vehicle transition type is happening, all this new infrastructure is being invested in, uh, relevant stakeholders and communities have to have a say in that transition. It has to come uh, at least in part from the bottom up and it can't be all top down. Um, the second is uh, kind of the core one, ensuring that charging needs are met in alignment with uh, the 2035 timeline, if that's what we're going to commit to as a state, uh, while also aligning with the actual transportation needs and preferences uh, of each community in the, in the state, um, as well as affordability of vehicles and fuel and infrastructure. The third is just that infrastructure has to go in uh, high utility and community appropriate locations. This is pretty straightforward, but uh, we do not have enough money to invest in chargers that do not get used, uh, nor do we want to start by investing in infrastructure that does not demonstrate the use case for these vehicles. Um, not everyone in California is interested in an EV or familiar with the technology. So demonstrating a really good use case and high use infrastructure is really, really important. And then lastly, this is one that is a little more complex, but uh, we're definitely working through, is the idea that as we make this transition, which the state has, has identified as a priority and we're setting via regulation, um, it's essential that transitioning to electric vehicles not create additional inconvenience or disruption or diminishment of services uh, for communities, and it cannot reduce mobility. It must increase mobility. So this can be private electric vehicles. This can be e-mobility, e-bikes, micro-mobility, shared vehicles. Whatever our community appropriate applications of zero emission technology, we need to be interested in and support. Um, but what cannot happen is electric vehicles become new policy, they're too expensive, charging is not available, and uh, people in certain communities throughout the state are priced out of the mode that their community is built around. So that's a really core principle. It's a complex one, but we're, we're trying to work through it and figure out how policies can, uh, can accommodate that. Um, there's the URL for our, uh, our project. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up and pass it back to Dee. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, the first question I'm going to ask just before we uh, bring Priyanka and Jen back to uh, thank you so much, everyone, for all those claps. I love it. Uh, back to the screen. Can you answer? Can you tell us a little bit more? Because I know that you talked about communication between cities and communities is going to be a really key step in the plan. And so because you're at the beginning, um, I, I know that those conversations have been taking place already with cities like Oakland, Oakland, since a lot of our viewers are from the East Bay. Can you talk a little bit more about that relationship and how that's going? Sure. Um, so as you said, yeah, we're, we're kicking off with, with some work with the city of Oakland and Oakland's in just a, a fantastic place here. They just released um, their zero emission vehicle action plan, which is a an, an offshoot of their equitable climate action plan. Um, and it's a strategy that sort of looks at how they can shape over the coming decade uh, transportation within the city uh, in a way that reduces vehicle use in appropriate, uh, appropriate zones and reduces emissions throughout. Um, and so they have this plan established and they wrote this without any of our help uh, at all, uh, which is which is it's a really wonderful plan and one of the first cities to do a really, really robust uh, ZEV action plan. And what we're going to do in conversations with the city is we're going to help them take on some of the actions in that plan, help develop some of the policies that they actually have identified as 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 specific strategies that they're going to move forward. And we're going to work hand in hand with them. And that's really our target is to do that with multiple cities and to meet them where they are in the planning process. 
Wonderful. That's perfect. Um, and I will go ahead. Like Jen said, we have so many questions rolling in. So we're just going to bring Priyanka and Jen back up. You guys did an amazing job with your presentations. We know that because we're getting all of these, <laughs> these questions coming in. Um, so why don't we hand things back over to Jen for, um, as I start organizing Ted's questions as well. <laughs> I know these questions are fantastic. Thanks for sending them all in. So um, Priyanka, I've got a question for you first, and this is about the 2035 report. So, you know, you talked a little bit about the modeling involved in the planning. Can you talk about whether there are, you know, I guess, let me rephrase, what, what are some of the essential assumptions in the modeling that you're making? I guess specifically, are there assumptions that are made about human behavior? Um, and are they, are they actually realistic assumptions to be made in the modeling? Yeah, um, great question. I think a couple of different pieces to talk about here. So the first is that the modeling that we did was um, an optimization modeling based off of techno-economic inputs, right? So as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, the impetus for this project was really seeing that battery projections are declining rapidly. We're seeing the price of solar drop rapidly. We're seeing the price of offshore and onshore wind drop rapidly. And so this was really the impetus for us to build that model. And using those price inputs, we were then able to optimize um, our inputs and create trajectories for um, vehicle sales meeting 100% electric by 2035. And I think that question is so important because it doesn't model human behavior, right? We're not, we're not looking at how do we convince people to take this decision on. We're just simply saying there's a path forward and this path has a lot of benefits. Um, but at the same time, I think the piece that I want, the piece that I touched on a little bit, the policy piece is really important here because that is going to be how you change human behavior by sort of creating those incentives and mandates and targets that Ted mentioned. Um, so it, it really all goes hand in hand, but no, we did not, we did not model. Got it. Thanks. Um, just one more question, since we're talking a little bit about cost savings. Um, are the cost savings that are highlighted in the report taking into account things like energy bills and upfront vehicle costs? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So I mentioned this in the presentation, but um, we look across a couple of different metrics. So we will calculate what is called the total cost of ownership. And so that includes your upfront costs, that includes your operation and maintenance costs, that includes your electricity costs or your fuel costs. Um, and then that also includes sort of the broader infrastructure. Got it. Thanks. Um, so let me actually ask this next question to, to maybe both of you. Um, people are curious to know, where is the electricity going to come from? You know, California is already not able to, to guarantee electricity under certain circumstances. Can you talk a little bit about what might happen when almost every vehicle might be electric in the near future? I'm happy to, Ted, if you want, I'm happy to <laughs> sort of uh, key, key this up. So this is a great question and it's a really important one. So the first thing I'll say is that um, California is setting the standard in terms of renewable installation. So for that first answer to your question, where is our electricity coming from? Um, we hope that by 2030 or 2035, most of that electricity is going to be coming from renewable sources. So that means uh, solar and wind, but also some of our existing sources in nuclear and hydro. Um, so that's the first thing, we hope. Um, California is doing everything they can. They're setting renewable portfolio standards. They're putting in the policy infrastructure in place, and they're making the commitments to actually achieve those goals. So that's one. But second, um, what you mentioned about um, sort of making sure that the grid is stable, we're adding in a lot of this electrification and transport will add a lot of electrification to the grid. And this is where things like smart rate design policies will be really important. So there are these really wonky terms called demand response and sort of um, time of use plans and um, all of these different utility plans around how to manage electricity use. And I think what will be really important is making that information as accessible and as available as possible to let people know that, hey, instead of charging from two to four, if you're able to charge from, you know, nine to 11 or six to nine, it's going to be cheaper and it's going to be easier on the grid. And of course, that is coupled with the absolute need for um, public charging infrastructure. That's just a fact and that's something we'll be needing to do. And uh, just to add on top of that, there's, there's definitely a scenario uh, where 
a huge build out of electric vehicles is adding a tremendous amount of just just demand to the grid and it and it stresses the grid. But there's also a scenario where a huge amount of electric vehicles are actually able um, through fairly straightforward and already very much existing automated charging technologies to charge strategically at times when power is uh, oversupplied and they can actually sop up that excess power in the middle of the day um, and when it's cheapest. And so there's a scenario where uh, actually a really uh, EV heavy system is better balanced than one without all those EVs because they can take a lot of very small demand in different locations and sort of absorb all the excess and then not charge if they're if they're plugged in at workplaces and plugged in at homes and stop charging when there's a high demand from the rest of the home and from the rest of the community. Um, so I think that there's actually a real hope that EVs can provide a service. And in some cases, we are not quite here in this technology yet in the US, but it exists um, to provide vehicle to grid uh, power back to a home or back to the system um, in, a, in a really powerful way. But I will note that a lot of the ability to take advantage of those cheap rates and those, uh, you know, those sort of uh, strategically timed charging options is typically based at the home where someone has control over the charger and can just get home, plug it in, let it sit for eight hours, and then, you know, pick the car back up. And for those who do not have access to a home charger or to their own driveway, um, it's a real challenge to be able to take advantage of charging at the most optimal moment because you can charge when you get to the the, the public parking spot and for the two hours that you're there. So that's going to be need to be a, a really sort of key factor in policy design and as Priyanka was saying, rate design to make sure that lower income customers aren't penalized because they don't have access to a personalized charging unit. Perfect. This. All of these conversations um, lend themselves really well to a bunch of questions we're getting. Um, so I'm just gonna put those questions forth. And if you want to reiterate any of the points that you just made, um, I think that will be great. So we're getting a lot of questions as it relates to any kind of evacuation danger for folks. Um, that idea we might have a large earthquake or fires and if we all need power and we need to get out, people mentioning that they already get stuck waiting while they're on the five going to Southern California and having to wait for a charging unit. Um, and then the time it takes to charge. And so are there plans in place? I get with all these questions coming in, I'll summarize by say, by asking, are there plans in place to prepare for something like that? Mm -hmm. That you know of for either of you? So I will say, I, I'm not honestly not aware of plans for what you're describing as sort of a, a, a massive rapid charge event. What I am aware of is plans to help everyone keep their uh, vehicles charged enough to get the right distance they need to get without having to charge in the instant. Um, but as I was mentioning earlier with, with potential, uh, you know, batteries as backup, uh, vehicle batteries as backup and as vehicle to grid resources, Vehicles can also provide when power is knocked out, um, maybe in a non-evacuation, but power limited zone during that kind of event, um, vehicles can provide really important power to homes um, and to keep people online for, for, for multiple hours if the system's down for uh, medical baseline customers, people who need their power on. So that future exists that, that is potentially very, very much more resilient. Um, but there, it, I, do, I do see that concern that's being raised. I'm not aware of any solutions on that front. Yeah, I unfortunately agree with Ted. I don't know of any solutions that are sort of readily available on that front, but I think this is an important point about we need electrification of our transport industry, but that means more than just cars. We can't do a one-to-one -one swap of ICE car for EV. Um, we have to make sure that we have modes of transport that are accessible, available, and rapid in the case of an emergency. Um, and um, there's a lot of creative um, opportunities in the next decade for us to build that out. But um, I think it will absolutely be a priority given the fact that California is on the front lines of climate change and some of these events that you mentioned. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate that point, Ted, and I hadn't thought about it that we had to deal with all this with gas as well, right? But we've learned to deal with that. We've, it's not like we have this abundance of gas. It's, we're stuck in lines at the gas stations as well, right? So this is a good point that we'll, we'll be figuring these um, solutions out. And to your point, Priyanka, we have a question about working with the um, public transit authorities. Um, can you answer any question re re regarding work that's been done with them specifically? Because that, that was your last point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that it's sort of in process right now. And Ted, if you have any 
thoughts about this, please feel free to jump in. Um, I am not directly connected to work that's being done, but I think something that I'm seeing a lot in the chat and that's been raised through this conversation is where do we get access to charging? Transit hubs are going to be so important. Getting a charging station in every single one of those parking spots is a great way to ensure that people have access to charging and they also have access to another node of transport. Um, something that we talk about in this space is this idea of smart mobility, right? We're not doing just a one-to-one -one replacement. We're creating nodes of transport where people can access multiple different types of transport that work for them. Um, so I think moving forward, BART and Muni and frankly, Caltrain and all of these other transit authorities need to be thinking about charging infrastructure. How are we going to build it out and how is it going to be accessible to people? Yeah, and I just, I would add, and I'm going to share this. I can't share with the whole group. So I'm going to share it with you, Dean, if you could share it back out with, uh, sure. with all the participants. Um, the, so the Oakland plan that I was mentioning earlier, um, it is a zero emission vehicle action plan, but they totally integrate plans to expand and connect private vehicles with public transit and with micro mobility. And as Priyanka was saying, it, I think it's 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 not even a question of is it going to happen or is it essential. It is the only thing that's going to happen is that cities are going to start to try to integrate these modes as appropriate. Um, and one just sort of minor note, but really relevant one, uh, you know, BART as an example owns some of the biggest parking lots in the area, um, and those are parking lots that are going to be a great spot to have a ton of EV charging. Um, and that's not just going to be for people who drive from out to plug a car in and then go get on BART and leave their car there all day, which is how people use a lot of BART parking lots. But overnight, those parking lots can be used for charging for everyone who lives near the station. And they can actually, we can use that public resource and that land that sits there kind of empty overnight and make it a resource that's accessible to the full community that neighbors that station. So there's, you know, there, there's a real option there for these, these uh, for public transit agencies to, to get more value out of this transition. Perfect. And on the flip side, there's the opposite question that, great, you know, we're working with these transit authorities, but what about private businesses? How can they take advantage? Has there been conversations or policies passed to think about private facility, garages, grocery stores, malls, and what work has been done with them for either the tax credits or private business advantages, those sorts of things um, on the flip side of all that, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll go first and then Priyanka would love to hear your thoughts on it because I'm sure it came up in the, in the study. Um, I mean, just yes, 100%. And in particular, from the context of, you know, where is charging most useful to people? And this is something that we really very much want to take on in our mapping exercises, which is, some business areas are absolutely ideal for charging. Places where people uh, drop their car off, they do their business for 30, 40, 50 minutes an hour, they pick their car back up, they can get a 50% charge in that period of time. Other commercial areas are not necessarily the best fit. Um, and they may not be a place where somebody leaves their car for a long period of time and gets benefit from that charging. And so I think there's a lot of diversity in the different kinds of public spaces that we talk about, libraries, churches, areas where people are going to spend a lot of time, schools in some in some instances that are absolutely some of the highest yield and their physical parking lots have space for this infrastructure, as opposed to some areas where doing it on the curb might be quite limited. So the answer to that is an absolute yes. And I think any city that's trying to get their residents access to charging is going to be working hand in hand with private businesses. Um, and it goes to the grid point as well, because some of the, the power is going to have to come from somewhere. And if, if, the, if the private businesses take all of it for all the extra capacity, the cities need to be in on that decision. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Bianca. Go ahead. Yeah. And I'll just highlight, I think that um, this raises a really important point, which is that the state is very much in conversations right now about how to optimize for this. Um, and I'll speak a little bit from some of the work that I did with the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Um, part of what they're doing is seeing what other countries around the world are doing in terms of transport decarbonization. So um, when you visit a place like the Netherlands, you'll see that the way that they've optimized their charging infrastructure is in those public-private partnerships where you have fast charging at places of business, maybe along highway corridors, so that if you're going on a road trip, you pull over to, let's say the McDonald's, you fast charge, you get your burger, you get on the road again. And I think these types of innovative solutions are going to be really important. Collaboration is going to be so important here and learning from other countries and what other, other people are doing is really going to set the way for us to 
access some of these creative solutions. So I, I think there's a real exciting element here. And I, I do, um, I hope that we'll see some of those rollouts, some of those incentives for businesses, as somebody mentioned, um, in the next five to 10 years. And um, also let's talk about, you know, roofs and uh, rooftop solar and um, sort of connecting all of those resources together to ensure that we have, um, you know, everyone bought in and sort of a fully integrated transition in that regard. Thanks, Mo. This, this conversation is super fascinating. Um, I'm going to take us in a bit of a different direction for our next couple questions. There are some people in the audience who are a little worried about the EV skeptics out there. Um, so a couple questions. First, when a policy analysis is performed, is it normal to also perform sort of a, an opposition or adversarial policy analysis to determine the profitability of, you know, countering the proposed policies for those who, who might have more interest in, in you know, corporate profits than individual profits. Um, and then the second sort of question I'll, I'll add on to that, which is around the same vein. You know, there've been a lot of, you know, anti-EV articles that are appearing in social media. You know, they seem designed to mislead potential purchasers about the economics of EVs versus gas-powered vehicles. So, you know, are there, you know, any thoughts about whether money is being spent to, you know, essentially throw sand in the gears of the current momentum toward the adoption of EVs? Um, short answer is uh, <laughs> yes, people are spending money to delay this transition. There is a vested interest in keeping the system the way that it looks right now. Um, I will say that the people who are yelling at the top of their lungs are a, are a minority of people. I think if you talk to the vast majority of people in pure economic terms, if an EV makes more economic sense, whether it's your new Ford F-150 EV model or your um, Nissan Leaf, if it makes more economic sense for a person, if they're able to save those $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 in fuel savings, consumers are going to change their mindset. And I think that point that you make, Jen, is really highlighting the importance of the work and sort of the, the outreach that we're doing here, right? Where we're talking about the benefits, we're showing people that it is possible to have an EV and benefit from it. And um, yeah, I, I, I think that um, it'll be really important to counteract those narratives, to call out misinformation when it happens, and also make sure that we're, we're putting the facts out there, we're putting the science out there. Because otherwise, um, those three or four people screaming at the top of their lungs are going to get louder and louder. Um, and I would just add, you know, for better or worse, this is a transition that is is very much going to be market led. Um, what we're talking about here is a lot of how the the state and how our different government entities can make sure that it is is it is as equitable as possible, which is which is essential because the market will not do that itself. But this is a market transition and manufacturers are announcing independent of any of that noise, 30, 40, 50, 100 percent zero emission targets for the 2030, 2045, 2050 range. They're all moving to, to battery electric and other zero emission modes. So people can be skeptical, um, but what's going to be available to purchase in uh, at, at dealerships and eventually used is going to be a zero emission vehicle. And um, once people start to see more of them on the road and they are kind of ubiquitous and they are quieter and they're cleaner and they're more reliable. Um, I think a lot of that will get taken care of, but there definitely are some bad actors that are probably doing a decent job of forestalling that transition by a few years. Thanks both for those thoughtful answers. Um, we've got a couple questions sort of focused on uh, the just transition to an electrified uh, transportation system. So can you talk, uh, and maybe Priyanka or Ted, you both have answers for this. How, how do we evaluate the environmental impact on communities that are most affected? Um, you know, for example, you know, about battery materials. Some, some battery materials are mined in places where there are no protections for those who are doing the work. Um, so might this be true in some cases with fossil fuels? How do we know something's cleaner for those impacted communities? That's an excellent question. And um, we have to be honest about the fact that um, the practices, whether they be in lithium mining or in fossil fuel extraction, can be harmful. Um, so the question is, we need this resource. And the good news is the technologies to excavate this resource are getting less and less and less invasive. Um, so 
how do we ensure that communities benefit um, from these new industries? Um, something that's talked about a lot in the just transition, especially in this sector, um, is something called a community benefit agreement, where a company coming into a community has to agree to a set of principles that are legally enforced through arbitration um, that allow the community to benefit from whatever is taking place, whether this be lithium mining or along the battery supply chain, manufacturing, graphite, et cetera. Um, I think those CBAs are going to be a really important um, grounding force to protect and uplift communities. But we do absolutely need to be um, vigilant and honest about um, the potential impacts because we don't want to recreate the mistakes that we made in the past. And um, unfortunately, we're not even unfortunately, we're just in transition right now and the transition is early on. So we're sort of learning and doing at the same time. Um, and that can lead to some mistakes, but it can also lead to a lot of opportunities for new ways of thinking about these issues. Um, yeah, I would just would, would note on the on the the end of your question, Jen, which is that uh, I mean the, the the problems are real and they're they are are devastating in in certain uh, countries where mineral extraction primarily occurs. Um, but the comparison point has to be uh, to fossil fuel extraction, which is incredibly harmful and dangerous and pollutes the air and the water. Um, and I just think that's a really relevant point to to keep in mind. And and there's been a few questions and comments dealing you know around sort of the. The fact that we're still talking about, you know, promoting private transit in cars, which is in inherently resource intensive, um, and that is definitely true. Uh, but the comparison has to be to the existing mode, which is, the, is what is attempt we're trying to replace. And in that context, I think that there is a lot of potential room for improvement, which maybe doesn't exist in the in the fossil fuel extraction and use environment. Got it. Thanks both. Um, you know, since we were talking a little bit about batteries, and tell me if this isn't quite in either of your wheelhouses, but there's been some discussion, you know, now that the raw materials for extensive electrification, you know, thinking specifically about batteries are, are pretty scarce, um, they, they might become increasingly scarce. So if that happens, what, what kind of future scenario are we looking at? Um, I will just say that, um, they're not scarce. Um, there's actually a lot of exploration that's happening right now in so many countries around the world. I'll name two recent examples. One is the Salton Sea. Um, if any of you are familiar with the Salton Sea, um, it was used to be a lake, it became in sort of like agricultural runoff, came into the lake, um, the area became sort of a frontline community in a lot of ways. It's now being revamped and um, folks who are living there are thinking about whether lithium extraction is possible in that Salton Sea. Um, if possible and if extracted, it could account for nearly 40% of global lithium demand. Um, I'll also highlight the recent example of um, lithium reserves that were just discovered in India a week ago. Um, and, I, and that is around roughly 6 million tons of lithium, which is almost as much as what you'd found in um, northern Chile. So I highlight these two examples to say, we don't know, really. We're just barely scratching the surface in terms of these resources, where to find them, how to excavate them. Um, and of course, understanding that we have to be careful, we have to be responsible um, and environmentally friendly. There is a lot of resource potential in the world. And I just would throw on top of that, uh, battery recycling and reuse exists. Um, petroleum reuse does not exist. Um, so there's a lot of technology to develop there that can make these uh, uh, resources much more sustainable over time. And we're just kind of scratching the surface. Um, and the second is, to the extent that there are limits on what's available, um, there's also limits on how much carbon we can put into the atmosphere. And if we continue to use the ostensibly unlimited uh, fossil fuel resource, then uh, none of this matters at all. So uh, it's, it's a good question to ask, but ultimately what we're talking about absolutely must stop. And so in that context, um, any replacement is better. Both excellent points. We love that. And perhaps maybe we will talk about, you know, a domestic supply of critical materials in a future Midday Science Cafe. So thanks for that. Uh, why don't I turn things over back to Dee? Yeah. Um, again, the truth bombs that are being set right now are really <laughs> opening for all of us. I hope you guys are, are 
have your arsenal of comebacks when folks um, are being EV negative out there. So I know I am, I'm collecting these. Um, but we have a lot of questions or several questions have come in all about sort of infrastructure being planned in rural areas as opposed to urban areas. So there's a few of those coming through thinking about you know, the eastern areas of the states, are there planning for that? Um, roughly 70% of the states are rural areas. Are there plans to focus on that? Or can you talk a little bit more? Um, EV microgrid charging, um, anyways, in, an upgrade to the infrastructure or um, in any capacity in those and what you guys know about that. So thank you. Um, I'll just kick off real quick. Uh, absolutely, as, and I put the, I showed the slide earlier uh, in terms of availability of public charging for rural areas. It needs to be a focus. Um, one of the benefits of, uh, of of rural areas that are more spread out is that there is there is less of a need for public charging because more residents have access to a private space, um, which doesn't mean they all can afford it, but they have access to the physical space on which to place it. So the planning process, the funding process is a different question, but the planning process is a little less complex in less densely populated areas. Um, but there is a major question about the just the, the supply of electricity in rural communities where there may be very, very little. In certain tribal communities, there are, are areas where there is not adequate um, energy to, to, to fuel or supply uh, DC fast charging at all. And so that's a real question that definitely state grid planners are looking at and rural transportation agencies and county governments, to the extent they have the capacity to plan for these types of issues, are definitely focused on them. But I think right now more as a sort of private uh, resident and homeowner uh, solution um, so far. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that other than um, I think that we are going to see, especially in these rural areas where utilities are spending a lot more time in particular to underground power lines to build out sort of electricity capacity out there and to strengthen grid resilience in the case of wildfires or other natural events, we're also going to see a lot of that planning happen in tandem where we're thinking about charging, but we're also thinking about, like you said, microgrids and sort of having access to backup energy storage. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Um, there is another question, and it's interesting because we all are, most of us are in this day, we're, we're talking about California and the goals for 2035, our California goals, but somebody asked a question about Kind of aligning charging standards and infrastructure across the U.S. to standardize that or to create that, or are there conversations? And again, you may be like out of my wheelhouse, um, but are there conversations happening? Kind of maybe then at a federal level about how we can work together um, to create some standards for the country. Um, yeah, I think all I'll, I'll say quickly that um, that is absolutely a question that is um, being addressed right now at a national level. As I mentioned, the Inflation Reduction Act is a lot of funding um, that is being allocated to this question. And I'll just highlight one example in particular, which is Electrify America, um, and that is the public charging um, network that is being built out across the United States. And this is going to be um, standard level charging. I believe it's going to be fast charging, but um, I'm not sure. So I'm happy to check that and come back to you on that. And um, it is, there are plans to uh, fully build that out across the United States. So that's going to be a huge national resource once completed. Um. I mean, really important question, but it, 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 this actually goes back a little bit to some of the other sort of comparisons to the existing infrastructure that we take for granted in the, you know, in the, the internal combustion engine world. But, you know, there are different kinds of internal combustion and engine fuel, and we have gas stations that provide diesel and we have gas stations that provide um, uh, regular gas and there are gas stations that provide both. And we have figured out over time, uh, uh, you know, a, a market system that accommodates both and has led toward uh, mostly a standard kind of vehicle, but there are some uh, diesel powered vehicles in, in this country. So this is something that the, the private market can solve over time. The question is how quickly can we reach sort of the, the, the uniformity there? Um, and as Priyanka was mentioning, the federal standards for the, the infl uh, not the Inflation Reduction Act funding, but the infrastructure bill funding, uh, you know, multi-billions of dollars worth of charging uh, investments for uh, highway link chargers, and they have pretty uh, stringent standards about accessibility. So the federal government is thinking about it. 
So um, we have just a few more minutes, but we have a ton of questions. I thought this one was really interesting. You know, you both have talked about the, you know, sort of the infrastructure of the grid overall, but somebody asked a question about, you know, that that challenging sort of neighborhood last mile for transit. You know, people sometimes, you know, don't know how exactly to get that last mile. So are people thinking about how, you know, things could be changed at the neighborhood level. Somebody suggested maybe could neighborhood power poles be um, used to take the additional capacity of charging, you know, cars in the neighborhood. Um, oh, sorry, Priyanka, go ahead. No, go ahead, Ted. Go ahead. Um, uh, uh, so much in there. Uh, I'll say on, on the on the last point on the on the the power poles and 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 uh, relatedly streetlights. Um, in certain communities, uh, Los Angeles is one. Uh, there's actually a really concerted effort to use existing streetlights as the power source and the the physical infrastructure, and it's working. Um, is really really cool, and they're able to do that in part because of the nature of the uh, municipal electrical utility down there, uh, which is different from uh, in other areas where PG&E is the utility, but they don't own the poles. So there's a challenge there, but existing infrastructure can definitely be used. Um, but more broadly, the uh, sort of the last mile, you know, getting from the, the transit hub or, or from work back to home is that's the perfect example where private vehicles are completely excessive for most situations, not all, but for most and perhaps not necessary. And so we're, if we can build a more sort of comprehensive ecosystem where people can opt into the least uh, impactful transit mode where appropriate, I mean, that's ideal. And if we can have charging that that suits different types of vehicles in one location, so you can bring your e-bike home one day and maybe borrow that from, uh, Oakland has an idea of an e-bike lending library that the city would run, borrow that one day, and then another day do the private car when you need to get your groceries or your kids. I mean, that that's the, low, the least emissions and the most efficiency. So that's kind of the target. Yeah, and all I'll say, I mean, Ted took the words right out of my mouth. Um, all I'll say is that we have a lot of really exciting new technology to cover that last mile mobility, e-bikes, e-scooters, um, but also, you know, making our cities and our our blocks more pedestrian friendly, um, being able to walk from tr one tran your transit stop to your last spot um, can be a really nice part of your day and sort of going back to this question of how do we build and create cities for um, for people and not for cars. And I think part of that is um, sort of tapping into some of these solutions. Thanks both. Well, you know, I think that might actually be a nice question to end on, it's sort of hopeful and optimistic. Um, I just wanna say thank you so much, Priyanka and Ted for your fantastic presentations. Uh, thank you to our audience. You were asking amazing questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll take a look through them and maybe see if we can get you some more information uh, to follow up. And uh, you know, before we close, um, Dee has a screen up here. We want to know how you think we're doing. We appreciate the feedback that we get from you uh, in between Midday Science Cafes and during the during the events themselves. So if you don't mind, take a few minutes to fill out our survey. Um, as always, uh, if you want to stay up to date on research coming out of the lab and on campus, you can visit Science at Cal at scienceatcal.berkeley.edu and berkeleylab at lbl.gov. Thank you so much, and we will see you next time. Thanks, yep, everyone. I just want to remind everyone mm -hmm. that the uh, talk will be posted on our websites and on our YouTubes and on our social one more time for you guys to watch over and over again as much as you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, everyone, for joining us. And thank you so much to Priyanka and Ted from Science of Cal as well as, as Berkeley Lab. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.